Hi, I'm Paul Hopewell. Welcome back to my shed. This is where I make all sorts of stuff, usually for old motor vehicles or machines. And I show you what I went through to finish the project. This video is the second part of two videos about making arbors for my old surface grinder. In the last video I machined the arbor adapter and balancing system. This one is about the threaded washers and the balancing buttons. I used a section of old angle iron because I hadn't anything else that was 6mm thick to make my threaded washers. Each side of this angle iron is 7mm thick and it should do the trick nicely. I set about carving it up into 100mm long segments. First from one side, then I'd intended to finish off the second side using the same method. Except I forgot about a very small detail. Definitely not one of my finest moments. However, five minutes with a hacksaw removed my brain fart issue with the bit that the power saw couldn't reach. Before going too far, I spent a few more minutes capping off the remainder. Now I can separate all four segments and catch each one as they drop off. Right, all I've got to do now is hack them all off along the corner, hopefully without having to use the angle grinder. Nope. 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 Oh. I need a copper. That's much better. Uh, maybe not. There's a lot of vibration because the material is only held in by a prayer. And I'm not very good at praying. Using this small drilling vise as extra mass also became a handy support in the process. The saw blade went through like a hot knife through butter. What is more, I'm glad I was wearing my safety boots. So while cutting the remainder I celebrated with a short clog dance at the end of each segment. The next bit was to remove the lip off this material. I elected to use the lathe for this operation because I can hold it in the forge or chuck and to be sure of holding it in four places rather than to be using the mill and only be holding it in three places. I need the material to be reasonably flat so that I can bolt them all together which is probably going to raise a few eyebrows. The back of the jaws provide a sort of flat surface with which to work from and the roughed front face left a surface roughly parallel to it. What I did do is drill a hole through all of them so that they could be very tightly bolted together on a single high tensile bolt. The holes had to be marked and placed central to the thickest part of the material rather than the extreme corners. I did this to ensure that I got the full washer out of all eight plates. If I got one or two wrong then I was still ahead on parts, because I only needed five threaded washers. The remainder were projected to become balance weight rings which were going to be smaller diameter. Well that was the plan. After drilling all eight plates I mounted them onto a single high tensile steel bolt. This bolt had been in the lathe to have the threaded end centred to receive the live centre. And as you can see the end result is a stack of plates resembling some sort of scarifier or meat grinder. Uh, yes I did get all eight washers out of this seemingly stupid arrangement but it's something I've had a lot of experience with on many occasions and with much bigger machinery. The tool I used was a neutral 120412 rhomboid insert tool. I would have used a 1.6 rad insert but I was out of stock. This is a KC850 insert. They are very tough inserts but they're not very hard, meaning that they can take the hammer longer than, than most inserts but they do tend to wear down faster. 
my little lathe isn't very powerful, so I was restricted to 20 thou depth of cut throughout. That's about 0.5 of a mil. I can hear some of you asking, why aren't you using that South Bend 13 lathe then? Well, I had another job in it and I've got to get that sorted out as well, so that's why I couldn't use that one. Not at that time anyway. After getting the washers unstuck from each other because the remaining paint became glue when it got hot, I drilled each one as big as I dared in the bore. And I needed some material left in the bore to get any run out removed before taking them to size. One of these threaded washers, by the way, is for the 2 inch by 12 TPI arbor. The other four are for the 1 and a quarter inch by 12 TPI arbors. After rough boring the washers, I replaced the jaws with soft jaws and clamped one of the washers in it. But on closer inspection, I felt it would be prudent to skim the chosen step, giving me a flatter and more stable platform to complete the washers. Now I could face the first side of all of the washers and I used a high speed steel cutter for this job. I had to clean up another step in these soft jaws because I needed a bit more room behind each washer for the thread cutting operation. I also dug in with the cutter so that each jaw would bite on the OD nearer the middle of each washer rather than on the corner edge. Using the insert tool gave me the required undercut to do this. After facing all the smaller bore washers to 6mm thick, this last one was faced off then opened up to around 1 and 13 sixteenths of an inch. That's about 45 and a half millimetres. Then turned it round and finished it to 6 millimetres thick. This is where I set the compound angle to 30 degrees for the bore threading operation. Each washer in turn was machined to size in the bore and double checked. Again, I've used a high-speed steel cutter for this job. I've already grown fond of using high-speed steel cutters in this machine because it leaves such a nice finish to the touch. Visually, well, it couldn't look any worse if you tried. As with everything so far that I've done on this machine, the bore threading is something else that I've not done yet. So like everything else, it's pucker factor 10 for the first throw of the half nuts. But as everything else on this machine, it's just the first time nerves that'll catch you unawares, and as it always comes up trumps, it's smooth as silk with just a touch of cotton. I machined each washer to a dedicated arbour, so when I was close to thread depth, I started to do trial fits to marry each arbour to each washer. The washers were all relieved nearer the bore by about 0.25mm, around 10 thou. And only the outermost 10mm of the washer and arbor will be in contact with the wheel. Thereby driving the wheel nearer to the cutting edge than it used to be. Whereas beforehand the wheel was being driven by a piffling 1.5 inch knot. It will now be driven by a 3 inch fitted arbor. After turning the washer round in the jaws I put a little decorative chamfer on the outside edge. Now to tighten the threaded washer onto the arbor body I marked out for a couple of blind holes to be drilled into the washers. 
Each grinding wheel must have a blotter between the arbor faces and the cutting material that makes up the cutting wheel to provide grip and to reduce damage to both the arbor and the wheel. Equally, the bite between the arbor and the cutting material must be firm but not tightened with excessive force. The tightening tool was made from a length of 5mm bar bent in half and then the ends bent at 90 degrees off to one side, providing a simple two-pin spanner that won't easily allow over tightening. Now that the arbor is done it's time to make the dovetail balance weights. I could make the balance weights like the ones that you see here but I think I might have been doing old farts day off when I put this lot together. The idea was sound enough but I should have put another process together before I buggered these up. Instead of machining a single ring to the following process, I should have machined two rings and then press fit one inside the other so that the joint face falls on the centre line of the grub screw. That way there wouldn't have been such a big gap when I'd finished. Also when I got to this point the two parts would simply have separated as they got cut off and I wouldn't have had to do this. Having such a big gap encouraged the grub screw to force the two weights out. They were also too heavy. Due to certain commitments I was forced to use another method. Buttons. One hole buttons. They would be lighter and I know weight isn't too important as they balance out the imbalance in the wheel and each other but I prefer the weights to remain resolutely in position. However if one does manage to get out well Let's just say I'd rather be hit by a 0.22 than a 38. After end and centering a length of 15mm bar, I drilled and tapped it to M6 to accept short grub screws that have now arrived from this supplier. The next task was to machine the outside diameter to the tapered intersection diameter. That involved a bit more maths, and to be totally honest with you, a little bit of luck. Well, a lot of luck really. But this is what I'm talking about. This is the cross section of the dovetail groove in the arbor body. I need to fit a dovetail button into it. It needs to be snug and remain flush or below flush to the outside face when it's fastened in. As I can't really measure it, all I can do is make calculations from my initial sketches. And the diameter I need is not across this dimension here, but across this dimension to ensure that the tapered sides fit together as snugly as possible, effectively adding this much to both sides of the button. So the first step is to machine the OD to the right diameter, then with the parting off tool set the length of the button. The idea here is to simply cut a small groove for the moment, I'll part it off later. I could then set about machining the taper using the tool that I made when the other cutters were done on the Clarkson cutter grinder. What I did was machine the taper until the witness just disappeared. Now, if I've got my figures right, the small end of the button should just snag in the dovetail of any one of my arbors. But if the arbor drops over the button, then it's back to the maths. Likewise if the arbor skips over the bottom. As it happened, Lady Luck was with me on this and I could part off my first one to check to see that it fits. You'll get to see how I fitted and checked it in a moment, but for now I had the arduous task of doing this 15 times more. I don't think I need all of them, but better to have a few spares. Now I've got to make them all fit into the dovetails. I could then mill an opening at opposite ends of the dovetail slot in the arbor, but I decided to use the linisher on the button instead. The idea was to lightly profile a small concave radius on the side of each button. Then on the opposite side I profiled a slight convex arc. 
That way the button should only pass through the dovetail opening with the concave flat, if there is such a word, lined up with the inner edge of the dovetail. And as you can plainly see, I didn't want to burn my fingers, so each one was mounted on a bolt and locked into place to stop them spinning off. Finally, I rubbed the sharp corner off the button so that it didn't trap in the dovetail groove. By trapping, I mean that once in the groove, I need it to rotate to keep it from just simply falling out. But this was difficult to see what orientation it was set at. To fix this issue, I simply marked the small end using a small hacksaw. And now, when I move these little buttons about, I know that they are in a safe condition when the saw mark is lined up radially to the spindle. There we go, we're all set up to have a go at balancing. That is once I've mounted a wheel on it. I'm waiting for a bunch of blotters for these arbors and at the time of making this video I'm still waiting for my order to arrive. One can only wait so long. No I can't. As I've shown you before on part one, these arbors fit like the proverbial glove. This is the first time I've used this wire tightening spanner in anger. It's uh, only temporary until I get five minutes to make one. A proper one that is. The arbor spindle was made from the tool that I made to set the wheel arbor spigot true to the bore. You can also see that at one end there's a small mark and this mark indicates that it's the largest end. The wheel arbor slides up this spindle and is soon locked on about halfway along it. To balance the wheel requires a balancer. This balancer I have is the one that I use to balance my pedestal grinding wheels. This works very well with them and I see no reason why it won't work on these wheels. Now I'm not going to show you how I balance the wheel because it's so time consuming that I'll like as not end up with a video being several hours long. So this is about all you'll get to see really. A short while later, <coughs> the wheel was good enough to make its debut. Then the wheel was removed again to balance it up once more. I dressed the wheel to a fairly fine finish like I did with the first test piece. The first thing I noticed was that the cut was a lot quieter and sounded cleaner. The stock removal weight was also much improved. When it came time to spark out, there was next to no spark at all. I do wish that I didn't wipe my fingers across the top of this workpiece because it was a very nice finish. I just couldn't help myself. In doing so, I seem to have left a very sweaty mark on the top. But there you have it, it's much improved. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.